Well, good evening to you again. This is uh, our second class on the Doctrine of the Holy Spirit, TH 464B. I'd like for you to open your Bibles, if you would, to Romans chapter 8. We're going to begin our study tonight on uh, chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. The first remarkable truth that we found in these verses is found in Verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. As we emphasized in our first class, it seems that the first three chapters of Romans is really dedicated to the idea of condemnation of those men and women who are uh, under the wrath of God, who found themselves outside of His salvation, and that wrath that will be poured out on everyone who is not a part of Christ and not a part of His kingdom. It is a very terrible and frightening picture of what awaits every unbeliever. And as great as the love of God for His children is, and as great as all of the eternal blessings are that he has for his children in like manner the wrath of God on the unbeliever is just as intense and just as extreme in the very opposite direction so this unfolding that's going to take place of a no condemnation status in my mind is about as good as it gets and it is not that it is a no condemnation status that is temporary or conditional it is an eternal no condemnation status it is a permanent unending and everlasting condition for every believer in fact this entire chapter is about the eternal security of the believer. If there was any place where I had to go and teach on eternal security, it would be Romans chapter 8. And it ends in the greatest doxology that we saw last week and mentioned multiple times that there's absolutely nothing that can separate us from the love of God that is actually in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the question that needs to be asked, I think it's a very important question, is how does the Holy Spirit actually reveal and display and display to the believer that they actually have this no condemnation status? It seems to me that one of the worst things that could happen to someone is that they actually be saved but not aware of it. Maybe that's not the right way to say it, that somebody could be saved and is constantly doubting the fact that they, that they are saved. I don't think there's anything that could be worse for a genuine believer than to always be doubting and questioning the salvation that God has given to them. Over the years, I have dealt with many people, just an enormous number of people, from all kind of denominational backgrounds and just in a way that really is kind of unhealthy spiritually unhealthy they are always debating whether or not they can lose their salvation and so their life just is always on hold they never really know whether or not they have no confidence as to whether or not they are saved or lost or what happened yesterday, am I still saved, am I still a Christian? And I can't think of anything that would actually be worse for a believer than having to debate that issue on a constant level. Today I'm saved, tomorrow I'm lost, the next day I'm saved, next day I'm lost. What a tragic place for a believer to end up. And yet, I just think from a doctrinal perspective that there are many that actually take that position. They do not, for whatever reason, believe 
that the salvation of God is stronger than the sin of man. But it is. It's a done deal. And we need to appreciate that. So there's just nothing that's much worse for a believer than this questioning and someone questioning all the time whether or not they are saved or not. It just drains the individual. It exhausts them. It's like it just pulls the plug out of their spiritual life. And to make it worse, they become incredibly legalistic in their approach to everything, and they bring others into that same bondage. You know, as believers, we have tremendous freedom. We have just tremendous freedom. We, we have tremendous joy. And the last thing I want to do is to, to, to be placing somebody into a kind of spiritual bondage where they're always having to question whether or not they've ever even been born again. Or if they were born again, they lost their salvation, and now they're trying to get it back. What a very, very uh, frightful place to find yourself. And so, from a practical perspective, I think this idea of now being under a no-condemnation status is a very important truth to understand. And we want to understand how it is that the Holy Spirit can actually authenticate and validate this truth to us personally so we don't have to always be struggling with it. So we don't have to always be debating whether or not we actually have been saved. And I think that that occurs, this how-to, this how occurs in Romans chapter 8, verse 2 and 3, which we will look at. It says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, and He condemned sin in the flesh. Now the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. What the law of sin and death could not do for me, the Spirit of Christ has done for me. It's made every believer free from that law that was operating in their life. I, it's important to carefully notice in verse 2 what Paul states that the Holy Spirit has actually done for the believer. He has made them free from the law of sin and death. That's why he's called here. When it begins in verse 2, it's, he is described as being the spirit of life. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus. He is a life giving spirit. He is a life transforming spirit. Everything that he does is related to spiritual life. And it's important for us to understand that particular outworking of his ministry in the believer's life. This giving of life. We don't come to the Holy Spirit and he he takes away life. You know, I, I've uh, shared with so many people so often over the years in pastoring and counseling with them, especially people that were struggling with different, a different area of their life, an area that they were having difficulty resolving. It may be in their marriage, it may be uh, some personal issues that they have. It, it could be a, a thousand different things. But one of the things that always comes up is that generally there is something in their life that the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, actually want them to remove out of their life. Something that they need to give up. It might be a bad habit. It might be uh, uh, just a terrible spiritual habit that they have, or a physical habit. 
uh, for a man, it could be something like pornography. Uh, I have uh, people that I know that, uh, that smoke, and obviously smoking is not good for you in any way. It could be a root of bitterness. Uh, I, uh, I know an individual right now that has this incredible root of bitterness in their life. And, and uh, for the most part, everything seems to be okay. But over the years, they developed a, a bitterness toward their father of all people. He was probably not uh, the kind of father that he needed to be. He left his family when uh, they were younger to go work somewhere else. And uh, there was just a resentment that built up because of that in their life. And they have this root of bitterness. And the more that you reflect on something, the more you become like the thing that you reflect. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so, and so rather, you know, you've always heard people say, well, I'll never be like so-and-so. I'll never be like my dad. I'll never be like my mom. And yet they become just like them. And the reason is because they're always focused and thinking about that person and about all the negative characteristics. And as they think about those things, they, those negative ideas become, be, be, become them, in a sense. That's why we studied uh, in our last class about beholding the glory of the Lord. We focus on Christ. We, be, we become like Christ. The more that we think about Christ, the more that we become like Christ. I know that's a, a very simple principle. It's one that is just so simple that we, that we miss it. It's almost too easy. The more we focus our life on the things of God, the more the things of God become a part of our life. And the more that we focus on the negative things, the more those negative things become a part of our life. They begin to control us. And so the principle that I have shared over and over with people so many times is that God never takes something out of your life without replacing it with something better. He never removes something from your life without replacing what He removed with something better. He never leaves a spiritual vacuum in a person's life. And so, the Holy Spirit is a life-giving Spirit. That's what He does. He may be actively involved in correcting areas of a believer's life, and He may very well want them to remove something from their life, whether it's an attitude or a habit or whatever it may be, he wants them to remove those things from their life. But the reason is so that He can replace it with something that is much better. He is a life-giving Spirit. Sometimes you have to remove something that is negative so that what is, I'll say, positive and, and godly and spiritual can take its place. There are just some things that cannot live side by side. There are just some things that simply cannot be going on at the same time. And so, He is a life-giving Spirit. And we know that part of that is, is freeing the believer from what He calls here the law of sin and death was always operating against them and defeating them and bringing them into this status of uh, this condemnation status before God. You know, before salvation, every believer, every unbeliever was judicially guilty before a holy God. Every, every one of them. There's not a single person that was not totally and completely guilty before God prior to salvation. And there was nothing that they could do on their own to remove that guilt. 
or to remove that condemnation, no matter what they did. Now, I know this is basic Christianity 101 for most of you, and I'm not trying to insult your spiritual intelligence here. But the unbeliever has no power. They have no ability. There's no means. They don't have any tool in their toolbox that will allow them to remove the guilt and the condemnation status that they find themselves in before God. They were constantly living in sin and living in a way that dishonored God and dishonored Christ in a way that demeaned that which was of God. They ignored the things of God. And if you think about it, even though they never ever saw it that way, they never understood that sin was actually controlling them, that sin had a power over them that, that in their life was unrecognizable, they were living in sin and they were actually being overpowered and conquered by sin. They didn't even know that they were in a war against sin. They didn't know that they were being overpowered by sin. They didn't know that they were being conquered by sin. They didn't know that they were being brought into the bondage of sin at a daily level. It was just... It was just Something that they never saw, they never understood. And if you tried to explain it to him, the natural man didn't even have the ability to understand that which was spiritual. So they're in the worst scenario possible. They're in the absolute worst condition that they can be. They are sinners that are being completely controlled by sin. And no matter how much somebody may try to explain that to them, they can never see it. It's like they are blind. They have been blinded by this incredible thing called sin. And so, sin was always stronger than their ability to resist it. Are there moral people? Sure. Are there people that do benevolent things, do good things that aren't Christians? Sure, sure there are. There are plenty of those kind of acts and deeds, benevolent deeds that take place on a daily basis. A lot of people are benevolent and, and good in terms of what they're trying to do for somebody else. But they're not God good. They're not God good deeds. They're not deeds that are being done to glorify Christ. There are deeds that are being done to, to magnify and exalt them and to glorify them in a sense. And they're not willing to give God the glory. And so, they never thought that sin was sin. They just, they, they couldn't buy into that if they had to. And so, they never saw it that way. And yet, all along, there was this lethal and inoperable sickness that existed in their life. It was overpowering their life in every single area of their life. You have to get the picture here. We have to understand how desperate the lost person actually is before we can appreciate this remarkable work that the Holy Spirit is performing on their behalf. Man is so in bondage to sin. His mind is twisted. His understanding has, is just absolutely depleted of anything godly. There's no understanding whatsoever. And there, he has no power to overcome any of this. To the contrary, he is constantly being overcome by sin and never understanding that that is even, even operating in his life. Sin was so deceptive, so deceptive that it never allowed the individual to see themselves the way that God saw them. And they just could not accept God's verdict. Of, There's none righteous. No, not one. You know, if you go back and you study that passage there in, in Romans chapter 3, beginning verse 10, 
it's 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 amazing to me how God emphasizes these these things that these truths that He is delineating here. For instance, He says, "There is none righteous, no, not one." Well, why does He say no, not one? Because the moment that He says there's none righteous, somebody's going to say, "Well, I know somebody." You know, my grandmama, she was a sweet a lady. You know, she did this and she did that and she took care of the family and she cooked all the meals and she, uh, she killed the chickens and, and washed the clothes and she did all of those things. She, my granny was wonderful. There's none righteous. There's not one single person that's an unbeliever that is righteous. They don't understand. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks after God. There's none who does good. No, not one. Somebody's going to say, well, there has to be at least one. No, there's not. That's, that's the issue. There's none who understands. This indictment here is as strong as it can be. You can't find a stronger indictment than he gives here in Romans chapter 3. And so man just is not able to accept God's verdict. They, they can't understand it. They can't appreciate it. They're not willing to accept it in, 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 in any way. And so the ultimate result of that state and of that spiritual blindness is one that places them under the judgment of God. Something that they cannot remove on their own. Every man right now today that is without Christ is under the wrath of God. The wrath of God is hanging over their head. If they're killed in, a, in an automobile wreck, if they, are, if, if they just have a heart attack and die, they are under the wrath of God and the wrath of God will prevail over their life. Just a couple of days ago, a young three, 23 year old man in the, in the town in which I live was, uh, was driving down one of the main roads and there was a lady that worked at Walmart and she, for some reason, was just kind of walking, I don't know if she was crossing the road or what, this is a very... Uh, busy road, especially at a very busy time of the year. And I don't, I don't know if it was at night, if the man just didn't see her or whatever, but he hit the lady and killed her. Now, a minute before, a minute before, I have no idea about this lady's spiritual condition, but let's just assume that she's lost and without Christ. A minute before, 30 seconds before, she had no idea that within just the next few moments that she is not only under the wrath of God, but that she is going to be experiencing the wrath of God. That's the condition. We, we just, uh, maybe, maybe I'm just naive and undiscerning about this, but this, this is something that is so magnanimous in its impact on people that they do not know and do not even appreciate that they are under the wrath of God. Sovereignly, God in His mercy and grace has set each believer free from what I have just described. They're free from both the sin that can control them and they are free from the spiritual death that awaited them. They are free from the wrath of God. They are free from the judgment of God. They are free from His verdict that, depart from me, I never knew you. They are free from this sin that controlled them. It's not that sin doesn't exist. It's that they've been brought into a no condemnation status. If salvation did not actually free the believer from the sin that was previously controlling their life, then in reality, you, we could never call it salvation. I mean, why would we call something salvation that didn't free us from the very thing that was impacting us? 
This is what salvation is. This is what salvation does. This is how salvation works. It frees somebody from the law, this prevailing principle. You know what a law, you know what the law of gravity is? If I, if I took my Bible here and I just let go of it, it falls to the desk. Why? Because it's under a law. It, it's a never-changing law. It's always working. Now, somebody's going to say, well, we have these gravity machines. You know, you put somebody in a gravity machine and they're kind of weightless. Yeah, but you've got to have a machine to do that. Because the, Why do you need the machine? Because the law's still working. A, a law is a principle that never changes. It's a, it's, a, it's a principle that is always working. Gravity is always working. It's always in motion. It's always doing what it's always done. And so, the believer has been set free from this law of sin that has controlled and dominated their life. Salvation by its very nature is something that frees and something that liberates the believer from the power of sin. I want you to think about this for a minute. I don't want you to kind of just say, well, hey, we already know this. Listen, there's a difference between knowing something and what you knowing, what you know impacting your life. Every single one of us, every one of you that are taking this class, you, if you are a believer, you have been set free from the law of sin and death and from the power of sin that controlled your life prior to your salvation, the Holy Spirit sets the believer free. The verb for set free is in the aorist tense, which means that it's something that happened in the past, but it's having an impact on the present and will have an impact on the future. It means that it happened in the past once for all. That's what the aorist tense does in the Greek verb. It happened once for all. That's the only time that it's going to happen. It was, it was a monumental event when the Holy Spirit came into your life and indwelt you and through the conversion process, you were set free from the law of sin and death. I'm not, this is not kind of mental gymnastics here. We're not playing some kind of spiritual formula game. This is life-transforming truth. Do I struggle with sin? Absolutely. Do you struggle with sin? Absolutely. Sin is still existent, but I'm free from its dominating and controlling power over my life. They're not... I remember before I became a Christian, I did everything you weren't supposed to do. I did. I was an unbeliever. I lived in unbelief. My life had bad habits to it. Uh, I took drugs. I, I drank. I smoked. I cursed. I used God's name in vain. I looked at things that I shouldn't have looked at. My life was completely dominated and controlled by sin. And from the moment that I was saved to this day, I've never gone back to those things. I don't smoke anymore, I don't drink, I don't curse. Why? Because I was set free. I, those things can tempt me. I mean, they don't, but they can tempt any believer. Those kind of activities that we were involved in before we were saved, they can always come back and kind of raise their ugly head at some place in our life. But we've been set free from their control and from their domination over our life. I've never gone back to those things. From the very night that I was saved, I, I, I just, there was, it was gone. It was done. Have I ever been tempted in different areas? Absolutely. Have there maybe been times when I yielded to a temptation that I shouldn't have yielded to? Absolutely. Everyone has. But I'm not living under the control of those things. Why? Because as a believer, I have been set free from the law of sin 
and death. So Paul is not describing here what can happen to a Christian. He's not describing what may happen to a Christian, what is possible to happen to a Christian. What the aorist tense signifies is that because somebody is a Christian, that this being set free has already and permanently happened to them. In other words, I think this is the right way to say it, is that no one can actually be a Christian unless this has happened to them. You can't be a Christian but not have been set free from the law of sin and death. It is something that has taken place in your life. And so every believer used to be standing under this awful wrath of God, under the condemnation of God. If something had happened in their life that was unfortunate, they would have died in their sins. They would have been issued, uh, ushered immediately into the very wrath of God over their life, into a, a place of indescribable horror that they could not imagine. But when the Holy Spirit called and birthed us into God's kingdom immediately, not next week, not next year, not once you reach a place of maturity in your life, but immediately, we were set free from this law of sin and death that had downgraded us to a place where we had no desire for God. We had no intent to know God. We had no pleasure in spiritual things. We had no interest in the Word of God. We had no interest in, in the church. We had no interest in, in what uh, awaited us. And we were just set free immediately. Immediately from each of those things. And now our life, your life is intent on honoring God. You you want to if you're married and got children, you want to you want to be a good husband to your wife, you want to be a good wife to your husband, you want to raise your children in the nurture and the admonition of Christ, you want to you want to fellowship on a regular basis with other believers, you want to read your word, you want to spend time with God interceding for people. Good things. Godly things have taken place in your life. Why? Because now you don't have all this weight, all this spiritual weight of the bondage of sin just overpowering your life. Do you fail at times? Absolutely. But you're not overpowered by those things. You're not controlled by those things any longer in your life. No wonder in Romans chapter 8 and verse 15 it says, Now we just cry out, Abba, Father. Hey, I have a new kingdom. You know, I grew up, I think I shared this in the last class, I, I grew up in a family without a father. In fact, I didn't have any grand, grandparents. Uh, I, never, I never saw my father, and because of that, I never saw my grandparents on his side. I never saw uh, my, uh, my grandfather on my mother's side. He had died before I was born, and my grandmother, who we actually lived with, uh, had a stroke about two or three years after we came. I was only seven years old when she had a stroke. She couldn't talk. She couldn't move. She, she had to be under full-time care. I, I grew up in a family without a father, without grandparents. Really kind of without a family. I just had my mom and my sister. And you know what? When I was saved, just deep, deep down inside of my heart, I was able to say, Abba, Father, I have a Father. I have a Father that loves me and that cares for me. Next, it's necessary to look at the phrase, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The term here, the Spirit of life, is a reference to the Holy Spirit. There are two places where this particular term is used. I think the other place is in 1 Peter, I think. And uh, it is a phrase that speaks of his ministry as one of giving life to the believer. He gives physical life, he gives spiritual life, he gives eternal life. It's not just breathing. It's not just being, uh, uh, you know, just giving us kind of... Uh, uh, physical life. 
There's an eternal nature to what is taking place in our life. There's a spiritual nature to the life that He actually gives. And so He is the member of the Trinity that bestows all of these things on the believer. Everything that He does is unto life as being opposed as unto death. In words, He's his, he is the spirit of life. He's not the spirit of death. He might be the spirit of death. He might be the one who executes the judgment of God on an unbeliever in different ways. But for the believer, he is always the spirit of life. There's not one single thing that the Holy Spirit would do in a believer's life that would lead them into some form of spiritual death. Not one single thing. You cannot find one single thing. Now, He may convict you of sin. He may convict you of things in your life that are not right and things that He wants to remove out of your life. And you may feel like it's death. And in a sense, you have to die to that before you can live to what, uh, before you can experience the life that He has to give. But He is the Spirit of life. His goal is to always give to the believer the spiritual life that they need in order just to simply be spiritual and to be Christ-like in all that they do. So everything that He does is unto life and not unto death. So this phrase is referring, when we talk about the Spirit of life, it is referring to the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit that is operating in every believer, listen carefully, right now. It's operating in your life right now to deliver every single one of us from the power of sin that always leads to some form of death. If I get involved in some kind of sin in my life, the only thing it can do is to destroy that part of my life. Let me just use an obvious example. Let's just say, for instance, that for some reason I became involved in something like pornography. Well, you know, the only thing that that can do for me is, is that it destroys my, it can destroy my family, it can destroy my marriage, it can destroy the spiritual ministry ministries that God has provided to me. It can destroy my imagination. It can destroy my willpower. It can destroy every part of my life. It, it can do that if, if I yield myself and submit myself to that. But because of the power of the Holy Spirit that's operating in me, the power that's operating in your life that is right now, today, tomorrow, next week, every day of your life is operating on your behalf to deliver, to deliver and to free you, to liberate you from that power of sin that wants to control you and will ultimately lead to some form of death. The wages of sin is always death. It always destroys something in its wake. It could be physical death, it could be emotional death, it could be relational death, it can be ultimately spiritual and eternal death in the lake of fire for the unbeliever. This is a very powerful ministry that the Holy Spirit has in our life. I am, you know, just as a believer, I am so grateful that just on a regular basis, on a daily basis, on a, on an in, at an intimate level, that I know that my life is being delivered from the power of sin. Does sin want to destroy me? Sure it does. Does the devil want to, does the enemy want to destroy our life? Absolutely. He wants to destroy everything about us. He wants to destroy our families. He wants our children. He wants our grandchildren. He wants our churches to fall apart. He wants our personal lives to fall apart. But we have been delivered. We have been set free from all of that sin and death that surrounds and clouds His work. 
So verse 2 is to be interpreted in terms of the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit that is operating within the believer to deliver them from this realm, this law. I've been set free from the law. You've been set free from this law. If I can say it this way, you're no longer under that law. Before salvation, that was the only law that you were under. You could not do anything but sin. But now you've been set free from that law of sin and death that controlled your life. Now, this needs to really be made practical. This power and presence of the Holy Spirit within the believer's life should be the distinguishing mark of their life, of what it means to be a Christian. And His presence in the believer's life, just the very presence of God indwelling the believer, means that the power of sin over that believer's life has been defeated. When somebody is born again, when they initially enter into the kingdom of God, at that moment, at that moment, not later, not after you've done a few Bible studies, not after you've been discipled by somebody in the church, not after you've been baptized, not after you've taken the Lord's Supper, not after you've become a member of a church, not after any of that, at that moment, you have been delivered from the law of sin and death. And this it's important to appreciate this and how it gets worked out into the believer's life in a practical way. This is a major part of God's answer to every believer's sin problem, this giving to them the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. This is how God helps to develop, helps the believer to deal with the issue of sin in their life. The law of sin and death was and is still incredibly powerful. All we have to do is just to look around. All we have to do is to simply just watch people live their lives out. You know, as, as a pastor, I, I see we have people that come and go in our church all the time. Uh, any church does. They have people that come in the front door and they go out the back door in a couple months. You know, they, they were never really serious about their Christian life. And then, then later on you'll hear about that person and where they are in their life. And maybe they got a divorce and, and this happened and that happened and they just never seemed to make it. We hear these stories all the time. Why? Why do we hear those kind of stories? Why do, why do things just not work out the way that they should work out. It's because of the law of sin and death. Sin is operating and it's creating death in the life of that individual. Remember we said it could be any kind of death. It could be an emotional death, a spiritual death, a relational death. That happens all the time in marriages. It just happens all the time that people that used to be lovers are now enemies. People that used to be the best of friends are now the worst of friends. It's the law of sin and death that's working in a person's life. And it operates constantly. It doesn't have to get your approval to be operating. It's just working. It's just, it's like, the, it's like gravity. Every time that I drop that book, it's going to drop. It never takes a vacation. And sin never seeks somebody's permission it never says, well, is it okay with you if I intrude into your personal life and destroy it? Is it okay with you if I come in and break up your marriage? And, and uh, is it okay with you if I uh, create some debilitating sin in the life of your children while they're at school? It, that, there's, there's, no, there's no asking here. There's no permission that's being granted. But however, there is another law that is working in the life of the believer that is stronger than the law of sin and death. What is that law? It's the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. 
right now, I use this illustration again. Here's my Bible. It's sitting on top of this podium. And as long as it's sitting on top of this podium, even though the law of gravity is working, it's not going to fall to the ground. Why? Because there's a stronger law that's holding it. If I move it to the side, it'll fall off. It is, there's a stronger law. There's a deeper law. There is a, a law, a principle, if I can call it that, that's operating on the believer's behalf right now so that sin will not overcome their life. So that sin will not overtake them. So sin will not consume them. So that sin will not destroy their life. And it's much, much, much more powerful than the law of sin and death. Life is always more powerful than death. Just think about what happens when somebody dies. Just think about what happens and they, they place them into a casket and they put them into a grave and they are never able again to enjoy anything. Life is always better than death. And the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is operating in every single one of us. It's a life-changing truth. It has this innate spiritual ability to absolutely transform an individual's entire life. Somebody hears the gospel, the Holy Spirit quickens their mind and their heart to the truth with this indelible truth and they are brought into God's kingdom and immediately, immediately, they are under a no condemnation status. Well, what if I fail? Well, there's no condemnation. Well, what if I sin? Well, there's no condemnation. Well, what if I just have a horrible fall? There's no condemnation. You've been taken out of the realm of condemnation and you've been brought into the realm of no condemnation. There is no condemnation for the believer in the kingdom of God there is no condemnation what an incredible an incredible truth you know I, I I'm, I'm like everybody else I have to go before God and say Lord you know I, I have to exercise 1 John chapter 1 and say Lord I have sinned against you I, I've done Something I shouldn't do, and, and it grieves me. I know it grieves you. But you know, I can do that, and I'm, and done. I'm done. I'm, I'm just done. After I, my fellowship with God has kind of been restored through confession, I'm done. I, I know, I'm not sitting around debating whether or not I'm condemned, or, or whether or not what happened is something that is going to continue to control my life. I, why? Because I understand this simple truth that I am in a no condemnation status, even if I had not have asked for forgiveness. Even if I had not sought the cleansing, this daily cleansing that needs to take place in every believer's life. Even if I had not have done that, I'm still in a no condemnation status. I may not receive the rewards in eternity that God would have wanted me to have, but I'm still in a no condemnation status. It's a very, very important truth that we will never face condemnation from God. And so... In Romans chapter 8 and verse 3 is also a very important verse to understand. In essence, it further reveals the gospel by saying that the law could not do anything for the believer and they're trying to keep the law could not do anything for them. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. The law couldn't do anything for the believer and even if they kept it, it wasn't going to do anything for them. So God had to do it for them. God had to do it for them. God knew that nobody was going to live a perfect life. He said, even if you, you know, you, you keep all of the parts of the law, but you just sin, you just fail in one of those areas, you're guilty of the whole law. 
So all that the law could do and its whole purpose and design was to convince men that they could not keep it. And so they went out and made all these rules and regulations so that they could keep it. And in reality, they were destroying, they were destroying the truth that the law was designed to communicate to them. So it reveals that God has to do this. It says in verse 3, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did. This is something that God did. What the law could not do. What it absolutely could not produce in a person's life, God did. God did. God had to do something. And He did so by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and on account of sin, He condemned sin in the flesh. Now, exactly what was it that the law could not do? I mean, law's a good thing. I, I like the law. I, I personally I like laws. I like stop signs. You know, I, I like speed limits. I you don't if you were to ever be in a in my truck with me, you, you're never going to find me going down the road fast, ever. Whether it's on the interstate or just down the 55 mile an hour road outside here. I'm, I'm just not a speed demon. I'm not somebody that really is intrigued by going fast. And I like stop signs. I, I like them. I think they work good. I think stop lights are a good thing. I like laws. I like the fact that, that there are laws out there that protect us. Laws that are designed for our good. So what was it? However, that this law that God gave could not do. Well, simply stating, it could not save anyone. And even if they kept it, it could not keep them righteous before God. In fact, by showing the divine character of God and the divine standard of God, it was revealing in reality that no one could actually keep it. That was its purpose, to reveal it was a schoolmaster. It was a it was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, because we could not keep it. In a sense, it condemned everyone simply because it 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 it, it exposed that no one could actually keep it. It is not that the law was bad. There's nothing bad in the law, but it revealed the holy character. And nature of God. It contained His character. It contained His holiness. It contained His righteousness. And there was not one single person that could ever measure up to any of those. Believers love God's laws. They concur with the psalmist which said, They are my delight. I delight in the law of God. Psalm 119 certainly is uh, one of those classic places in all the scriptures where the psalmist is just, is just he's almost delusional about how much he loves the law and, and how much the law can do for his life. But he can't keep it. He cannot keep the law. God had to do something supernatural that he absolutely, the individual, could not do. And so even though we might love the law and even though we might appreciate it and embrace it, in and of itself it cannot do anything for us. And all it does is remind us that we cannot keep it. That's what it does. And to make it even worse, this is the worst part of it, it never so shows any mercy. Whatsoever. It's not a merciful, the law is not merciful. All it does is constantly remind us that we are not able to keep it. I, unfortunately, I got stopped for a speeding ticket one day that the policeman um, got the wrong person. I've been over to the hospital 
had actually uh, led a man to Christ that was, I'd gone with another man in my church, led a man to Christ that was dying of cancer. One of those deathbed type conversions, pretty remarkable thing. Somebody I didn't know, he had never seen me in his, my life. And, uh, but my friend here at church wanted me to go. It was a friend of his, and he wanted me to share the gospel, and I did. And on the way back, I, I had a white car, and there was another white car that passed by me at a very high rate of speed. I was going 57 in a 55-mile-hour speed limit. I had my speed control on, and another car went by me. They must have been doing 80 miles an hour if they were doing 5 miles an hour. And a policeman was coming down the other side of the four lane, and he, he, uh, there was sort of a, a hill, and uh, between the, he was over here, and I was up here, and he turned around and found a place in the road, and I looked over at my friend, and I said, hallelujah, he's going to get those guys, and the next thing I know, he turns the blue light on me. And I, I, I got a ticket, and I, I said, look, I, 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 I was going 57. He said, well, even if it wasn't you, but he never, he never agreed with us that I wasn't speeding. And he said, well, even if you weren't, I have to give you a ticket. There's something called, uh, it's called absolute speed or uh, absolute something. And it means that if you're going one mile an hour over the speed limit, that you have violated the law and that they are obligated to give you a ticket if they stop you and, and have, have uh, put you on their radar and it comes up at 57 or 87 or whatever it is, by law they have to give you that ticket. The law couldn't do anything to help me. It was completely unmerciful. And I really had not done anything wrong at all. But that's the way that the law of God is in our life. It never reveals the grace of God to an individual. It, it's not a graceful thing. It never forgives the individual. It just says, do this, keep this. And then condemns everyone when they do not do what it actually says. Here's the way Romans 3.20 puts it. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. It's unmerciful. It's unforgiving. It has no grace. And you've been delivered from that. I've been delivered from that. In other words, the more that you read it, the more knowledge of sin that it reveals to you, the more it reveals to you that you're not keeping it. The more you try to keep it, the more you fail, and the more that it condemns you. That's its design. That's what it's actually designed to do. It's like someone trying to love God with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the moment... The very moment that they try, they realize that they cannot do that. And that is exactly why they need this work of the Holy Spirit within their life. To help them do what only He can do, and that is to live the Christian life. You and I cannot live the Christian life apart from the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. It is impossible. It is a spiritual impossibility. It cannot happen. You know, if I have any goal in this particular course, especially in this second part of, of the course, it is to raise our awareness of this simple fact that we cannot live our Christian life apart from the Holy Spirit. Somewhere along the way, hopefully during these 16 messages that we have, these 32 hours of teaching, somewhere in all of that, that God is going to wet your palate. He's going to increase your awareness of the tremendous need that exists in your life for the Holy Spirit's work. In your life. So that's what 
That's what the Holy Spirit does. In Romans chapter 8, verse 4, there's another remarkable truth that needs to be understood as well. It says that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in them who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So what this verse states is that as the believer walks according to the Spirit, and as they obey the promptings of the Spirit of God, and yield their life to His divine impulses within them, that when that happens, that the righteous demands of the law is being fulfilled in them. In other words, it's the prompting, it's the divine impulse of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life that's given to them. And as that believer responds to that, what is happening is that the, the divine influence of that the law itself, the divine requirement of the law, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> is being fulfilled in that believer's life. It's important, I think, to understand that the reason this happens is simply because they are in Christ Jesus. In fact, if you look, you'll see that that phrase is used twice in the first two verses. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So because someone is in Christ, his righteousness and his holiness have been imputed to them. It's been given to them. It's been placed on their account. It is theirs. And what they did not have and what they could not attain on their own, God has given to them. He accredited the righteousness of Christ to their account. Something that they did not previously have. I mean, if you looked at their account, if you could have opened it up before they were saved, there was nothing righteous in there. You know, you would just think that this is the way I think that the average lost person would consider this. Even some Christians would probably think this. That if they could have opened their life up before, that, before they were saved, and just to open it up and to look at the account of everything that they had done, that there'd be some things on the bad side of the ledger and there'd be some things on the good side of the ledger. Now, you can adjust this if it doesn't fit with your theology, but from my perspective, that's inaccurate. I think if you looked up on my account and, and looked up what, what God had put down in my account up to the, the day that I was saved, that there wouldn't have been one good thing there. There wasn't one thing in my life that I ever did for the glory of God or for the honor of Christ. Nothing. Not one single thing in the first 23 years of my life. Everything was for me. Everything was about me. Everything was about what I wanted. Everything was about my life. Everything was about my ideas. Everything was about me. And if you were just to look at the evaluation of my life, it would have been none righteous. No, not one. Not one righteous thing in his life. You see, God's definition of righteousness and our definition of righteousness are two very different things. They have, they have, they come from completely two different directions. And just because I may consider something to be righteous certainly does not mean that God considers it to be righteous. And anything that is done outside of the work and ministry of Christ, outside of that conforming work of the Lord Jesus Christ, anything outside of the work of the Holy Spirit, anything outside of the will of God the Father, in spirit, in, in emotion, in will, whatever it may be, it's unrighteous. It's completely unrighteous. It has no value whatsoever. It is valueless. Valueless in the kingdom of God. 
And so, God has to do this. This is something that God has, has to do on behalf of the believer. So God gave Christ the sinner's righteousness, uh, unrighteousness. Uh, he took the sinner's unrighteousness and he gave him Christ's righteousness. And I have to say that it really was not a fair trade at all. It just simply was not a, a, a fair trade. My sin for his purity, you know, my condemnation for his righteousness. It just simply was not a fair trade. My dirt for his holiness and my depravity for his salvation. It was all given to the believer. It was imputed. That's the theological word, the biblical term. It was credited to their account. It was not that Christ just had to die for sins. It's not that at all. He also had to live a perfect life. Anybody could have died. He had to live a per he had to be a perfect sacrifice. And if he had not lived a perfect life, then he too would have needed a savior. So when they walk, when a believer walks according to the spirit, the Holy Spirit is displaying. He's putting on display the imputed life of Christ that has been given to him or to them. Many times they probably think of the Christian life more in terms of their being delivered from sin and from eternal punishment. I think if you were to talk about salvation to someone and just on a normal conversation, somebody in your church sitting next to you, that one of the ideas that they may have is that, well, I have been delivered from sin and I've been delivered from eternal punishment. They were saved and now they are new creatures in Christ and the result of all of that is that they have been delivered from the wrath of God. However, here in Romans chapter 8 verse 4, it tells them that much more actually happens to them. There's much more that actually takes place in their life. And the way, the, the truth of the, the matter is that they literally cannot enter into God's presence without God's righteousness. The way that this verse states it is that they must be able to fulfill the righteous demands of God's law. And that they all know that that is something that they cannot do on their own. I mean, how could I ever fulfill God's law? How could you ever fulfill God's holy laws in your life? I mean, no matter how hard someone may try, no matter how sincere they may be, no matter how good their intentions are, they simply cannot meet the demands of God's law. 1 John 1, 8 expresses it this way, if they say they have no sin, they deceive themselves and the truth is not in them. I personally cannot meet the righteous demands of the law. Even that is something that has to be done for the believer. And it's something that the Holy Spirit does for them in His transforming, life-transforming work. So if the believer cannot keep the law, in order for them to be able to enter into God's presence, something else has got to happen on their behalf. There's something supernatural that has to take place, and thank God it does. At salvation, the Holy Spirit imputes the righteousness of Christ to the believer. The Holy Spirit comes to your account and He erases everything on that one side, all of that unrighteous things, and on the other side, He puts the righteousness of Christ. He removes your unrighteousness and He replaces it with the righteousness of Christ. And so it's like you've lived a perfect life. I mean, just think about that for a minute. Just think about what the Holy Spirit is doing for you at the initial realm of your salvation, at the initial point of conversion. He takes everything that God has against you. He's nailed the handwriting of ordinances against us on the cross. He's taken all of those 
ordinances that were against us, and He has removed them, and He has replaced them with the very righteousness of Christ. So that when God looks at your, at your account in a judicial sense, in a forensic sense, when God looks at your account, there's nothing there that's wrong. He only sees what He would have seen if it was Christ Himself. He sees the very righteousness of Christ. It's been imputed. It's been given to you. Your account has been completely transformed. And now you're able to enter into the presence of God and to have fellowship with God the Father. The Holy Spirit placed the fullness of the righteousness of Christ into your account the moment that you were birthed into His kingdom. And by His simple act of placing you into the body of Christ, He is validating that the righteousness of Christ has been accredited to your account. The Holy Spirit has given us something that we never deserved and something that we could never have attained on our own. Now, in chapter 8, the second part of that verse, uh, of verse 4, what the believer is dealing with in these verses is the supernatural and life-transforming work of the Holy Spirit as provided to them in Romans 8. And the primary truth that we have seen so far, the primary truth that we have gleaned, is that the believer cannot live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit. I want to say this. I want to emphasize it. You know, some of my students in the past, I've asked for an evaluation from them of the class and how they enjoy the class. And <clears throat> on a consistent level, at times, uh, some of my students have said, well, uh, uh, Gary, you, uh, there are times when you keep repeating yourself. You keep saying the same thing over and over. And I have to say to you, uh, those of you that are taking the online course, that that's by design. I, I, that, I mean, that I'm very cognizant of the fact that I repeat myself. I want you to hear, I want you to hear and listen to these primary truths. I want you to hear them over and over. I want you to almost be bored with me communicating them. Listen, you cannot live the Christian life outside of the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. And if you're not even cognizant, if you're not even aware of that work that's going on and of the, His work that you need in your life, then there is a very good chance that you will not avail yourself of His indwelling ministry in your life. Now, how tragic could that be? To live out your whole Christian life in your own strength and in your own power, and all it leads to is frustration and irritation. All it leads to is defeat. You have to be reminded of these things. I have to be reminded of these things. And in the same way that you cannot be a Christian without the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life, you cannot live the Christian life without that same work. Paul admonished the Galatians in Galatians chapter 3, verse 3. He says, are you so foolish? Now, if you were to go back and study that particular word about how he said that. Are you so foolish? I mean, what he's saying, he's, he, this is what he's saying. He's saying, are you, are you just stupid? Are you just stupid? Do you just not get the most obvious thing in the world? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now trying to be made perfect by the flesh? Do you think that you can live the Christian life in your own power? You, you began in the Spirit. You've got to continue in the Spirit. So the Christian life is a spiritual life, and it needs a spiritual source to function properly 
And that source is the person of the Holy Spirit and both his presence and his power operating within the believer. So we've seen so far that the believer is in a no condemnation status before God. It's a permanent condition. It's one of those areas that should give them confidence about eternal security. That's what we've seen so far. In verse 2, it was seen that they had been set free. They've been liberated from the law of sin and death that was and always working against them. Right now today, my life and your life, the law of sin and death is working against us. It is something that's trying to always bring us under its control. But I've been set free from it. It's still working. It's still operating. But I've been set free from that law so that it does not control and does not dominate my life or the believer's life. And then verse 3 and 4, we've seen that because of what God did for them, that the believer is now able to fulfill the righteous demands of the law. But that is something that occurs through the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to look at the last half of verse 4, which states that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in them, here it is, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And I think what is gleaned from this last phrase is that the Holy Spirit has literally changed the believer's very nature. They used to walk according to the flesh. That's what they used to do. It was just, it was normal. It was the only thing that they could do in a sense. I mean, the only thing a dog can do is to live like a dog. The only thing a cow can do is to live like a cow. It's their very nature. But in essence, we don't do that anymore. We've been given a new nature. We, it's not that we have two natures. And they're always fighting against each other. We have the flesh, and it's always fighting against us. It, you can never conform the flesh. The flesh is not able to overcome the flesh. The flesh is flesh. It will always be flesh. There's nothing that we can do to change it. It will always be there to resist us. But we've been given a new nature. This is one of the most concise descriptions of what a Christian is and what a Christian does. A believer is someone who walks according to the Spirit. He is one who walks in conformity to what the Spirit desires for their life. And not, not according to the flesh. It says they do not walk according to the flesh. So the believer is somebody who walks according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh, and that's exactly what the true believer does. It's very clear. We don't need to make this difficult. This is not complex. This should really be obvious in your life. If I were to look at your life or if you were to look at my life, you ought to be able to look at my life, say the members of my church that have known me for years, they ought to be able to look at my life and to tell me that they do not believe that I'm living according to the flesh. There may be fleshly things that I do. There may be some mistakes that I make. But my life in general is not characterized by living in the flesh. It is characterized by living according to the Holy Spirit. So, the NIV actually uses the word sinful nature in contrast to the Spirit. It says in order that the righteous requirements of the law in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the spirit now i want to say i, I want to say this uh, I, I don't want i don't want there to be any mistake about my position on this theologically i do not believe that a christian can have two natures I just simply do not believe that. I don't think you can be a dog and a cat at the same time. 
You have one nature. You have a new nature. You're a new creature in Christ. You're a new being in the Lord Jesus. So at salvation, every believer's life underwent a complete spiritual transformation, and it was the Holy Spirit who was the one that actually performed that work in their life. They were eternally converted. They were eternally changed. They were eternally transformed. It was something that He did. It was His work. They used to walk according to the flesh, but now, go back, look at it, but now they walk according to the Spirit. It's important to appreciate that these are two completely contrasting images. Paul is teaching us here by contrast. He's saying, when you were an unbeliever, this is what you did, and now that you're a believer, this is what you do. You used to walk according to the flesh, but now you walk according to the Spirit. You used to live this way, but now you live this way. He's making a contrast. It's a very important contrast for us to grasp. And the, the two can actually be considered to be completely opposite of one another. There's nothing, there's nothing in walking according to the flesh that even resembles what it means to walk in the Spirit. In other words, you can't just be walking in the flesh and it kind of be fulfilling walking in the Spirit. It's not that at all. The contrast is just, they're just two opposites. They're on one extreme and the other extreme. One is walking according to the flesh and the other is walking according to the Spirit. They're always going in the opposite direction. The flesh never has any interest in the things of the Spirit and the, and the Spirit never has anything in the interest of the flesh. They're always going that way. One's going one way and one is going the other. They're utterly opposed to one another. They completely are opposed to one another in their objectives and what they want to accomplish. And they're, they're completely different in their influences on the believer's life. If you yield to the flesh, it's going to have a negative influence. If you yield to the spirit, it will have a positive influence in your life. And so one produces ungodly results, the other produces godly results. And one forsakes and dishonors Christ, and the other embraces and honors Christ. That we, what we are talking about here, this, this, this idea of not walking according to the flesh, but walking according to the Spirit, it ought to be obvious. It really ought to be obvious. This is one way, I think, that you can really glean whether or not whether or not somebody is really born again whether or not they have really experienced the new birth if somebody were to ask me what I thought was the most what doctrine within the church was probably the most what's the way to say this the most Distorted, the one that probably need to be understood the most. I would say it would be the doctrine of salvation. I believe if you went to just an average church out here on any given Sunday, and you went into the congregation and 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 that and and especially in different denominational uh, churches. There's just an enormous number of people in those churches that aren't saved. That believe that they are saved. Maybe they believe in a doctrine of works. You know, maybe they believe Joseph Smith. Maybe they believe this or that. Who knows? They call themselves a Christian, but in reality, they're not a Christian. And if you were to look at their life, you could tell that they're not living according to the Spirit. They're, they're living according to the flesh. I have people all the time. I, I, I kind of... I just know when somebody's going to tell me something that I don't like. Last couple of weeks, uh, I've done uh, uh, several things for, uh, for two or three people. Um... Just things that I did for them at a personal level. People that I, I'm not, I don't have any confidence that they are saved or uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to 
I don't want to stand in that place of judgment, but if, if you were to ask me, I would probably say no, they're not. And in each case, they told me, well, Gary, you know, uh, I, we're, we're going to come to your church. We'll see you this Sunday. Thank you for helping us. Thank you for doing this, and we'll see you this Sunday. And I've yet to see them. <laughs> I mean, I have just yet to see them. They, they, their life is not characterized by the things of the Spirit. It's just, if I want to go to church, hey, I'll go to church. That, hey, I'm, I, for a believer, it ought to be, wow, I can't hardly wait. Today, today we go to church. It's the exact opposite of that. Oh, no, today we have to go to church. You understand the difference between the walking according to the flesh and walking according to the Spirit? What Paul is saying here is that he's making a contrast. It's a very definitive contrast between an unbeliever and a believer. It's not that a believer cannot walk according to the flesh at times. We all do. But it's not the primary direction of our life. And when walking according to the flesh is the primary direction of a person's life, that's the red flag. That's the thing that ought to just be thrown up in our mind to say, hey, there's a good chance, there's an outstanding chance that that person has never come to Christ. They've never been saved. You'll probably hear me say it over and over again that the last thing we want to do is to give somebody the illusion that they are saved when in reality they are lost. What a tragic place. What a tragic miscalculation on our part to give somebody confidence that they are saved when in reality there's nothing in their life to indicate that they are. These are totally opposite things. There are no mutual similarities between the two in any aspect or characteristic. None. Zero. A big zero. There are no similarities between the flesh and between the spirit. They are going in the exact opposite directions. And so what Paul is defining in this phrase is that they've gone from one to the other they used to walk according to the flesh, but now they walk according to the Spirit. They're going in completely opposite directions. Romans chapter 8 and verse 5 through 7 expands how the believer actually walks according to the Spirit. The word for that begins uh, there in verse 5 establishes the upcoming verses as part of the explanation of Romans chapter 8, verse 4b. In other words, this is part of how the believer actually walks according to the Spirit. It says, For those who live according to the flesh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh. They, they just, they're thinking about things that are not of the Spirit. You know, it's like they just get up in the morning and they never think about God. He's not even a part of their vernacular. He's not on their radar. He's not on their spiritual radar. They, they just don't think about God. They're thinking about themselves. They think, well, what have I got to do? How can I make more money? You know, where are we going to go on vacation? You know, what kind of car are we going to get? Can we get a bigger house? Do we need a big TV? They're not ever even thinking about Christ. They're not thinking about the things of God. But those who live according to the Spirit, I'm going to add these words, they set their minds on the things of the Spirit. They get up in the morning and they're thinking about God. They say, hey, I want to read God's Word. I want to, I want to, I want to spend some time in prayer. What can I do today that's going to impact other people? How can my life bring glory to Christ? They set their mind on these things. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Just enmity. It's just, the word means it's hostile. The carnal mind is just hostile toward the things of God. It's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. 
Now Paul introduced all of this in, in verse 2. As he introduced this in verse 2, they are now living under the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It is something that verse 2 says has made them free from the law of sin and death. So, what is the regulating and governing rule of the believer's life? Is this controlling power of the Holy Spirit who's working within them? Just think about this for a minute. Just, just stop for a minute and think about what we're talking about here. It's right here in your notes. This regulating principle of a believer's life. That thing which governs them, that thing which, if I can use this term, that thing which controls them. That thing which regulates their life is is uh, this work of the Spirit in their life. This controlling factor of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And so verse 4 is the effect of that governing influence. Here you've got the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It's working in the believer. And because it's working in the believer, they're not living according to the flesh. They're living according to the Spirit. There is a logic to Paul's argument here as to what we ought to be actually looking for in the believer's life or in the unbeliever's life. They now walk according to the Spirit. His influence is governing their life. His control is governing their life. His power is working in their life. He's giving them the spiritual dynamic that they need to be to live a meaningful life. Christian life. Previously it was the flesh. They were all governed. They were all controlled by the flesh. Everything that they did was for themselves. It was selfish. But now that influence has changed and the indwelling Holy Spirit is governing their lives according to the will of God and in a righteous way. Now I want to say this and I want you to hear what I'm saying. I want you to listen very carefully. This is, this is the overriding governing characteristic. This is that which ought to be obvious in a person's life. I have a young man that comes to my church and bless his heart, he's fairly faithful in coming. Uh, he, he's, he's lived a very rough life very rough life. he been in and out of drugs, in and out of jail. Um, he's, I, I don't know. I don't have any confidence that he's saved. He tells me that he is. He's doing much better than he used to be. And he uh, says that he got saved in jail the last time that he was there. But when I look at his life, I don't see anything, I don't see anything, I don't see anything that's life transforming, it's just some words. He's depressed all the time, discouraged about this, about that, never reads his Bible, just comes to church when he wants to. It's just, it's something missing. I, I'm, what I'm saying in all this is that what we're talking about here is the governing influence. It's, it's what is governing and controlling the believer's life. It's the life of spirit. It's the, it's, the life of, it's the spirit of life that is governing and controlling that individual's life. Previously it was the flesh. And now it is the spirit. So it's vital not to lose sight of what this chapter is all about. It's about it is about a believer their eternal security, and the evidence of that is that they are living in the Spirit of God, in, the, in, in and according to the Spirit of God. They're living in the Spirit, by the Spirit, and living through the Spirit. And here it is described as walking 
as walking. I think you have to read that into that as uh, walking. It says up in verse 1, who do not walk according to the flesh, but it's implied they walk according to the Spirit. The same thing is in verse chapter 8, verse 4. So, uh, when the believer um, uh, walks after the Spirit, it produces life, it produces righteousness, and those are the two laws. Uh, and, and the other law is that if they walk according to the flesh, it produces death. Those are the two laws that Paul gives us here in verse 2. So it's important to appreciate this is one of those big theological truths. This is one of the large theological doctrines that every born-again believer needs to embrace is that you cannot separate justification from sanctification. You can't just be justified, be saved, but not be sanctified. You cannot separate the two. The difference is, is that in justification, it's a judicial act by God alone. I don't have anything to do with my justification. I do get to participate in my sanctification, and that really is the only part of my salvation that I get to participate in. You cannot separate justification from sanctification. They both are a work of God. If somebody has been justified, then it is guaranteed that they will be sanctified and that they will ultimately be glorified. You cannot just go from justification to glorification. You can't just be saved and live any way that you want to. Sanctification is a guaranteed part of the work of God, the process of God working in a believer's life. And so, sanctification is the inevitable result of justification. So if you see somebody, I'm just use this as, a, as an example. If you know somebody, see somebody, and they are all the time telling you that they are saved, but there's no work of God in their life, if there's no sanctifying work of God conforming them to the image of Christ, if they don't love the things of God, they don't love the people of God, if they don't love God's church, if they don't love God's word and spend any time in it, They've separated justification from sanctification. They've just told us that they were saved, but there's never any evidence of it in their life. I have a, a man that I know that he, uh, he came to our church for a while, and as soon as he got here, he gave me his pedigree. He told me about all the things that he had done and how he had been a a deacon in a Baptist church and how he had um, taught a Sunday school class and he had done this and he had done that and he was on this committee and that committee and he was giving me his spiritual pedigree. But there was absolutely nothing in his life for me personally that indicated that he was saved. He was just saying, hey, I got saved and, and I did all these things but there was no ongoing work. There was no evidence. He just came to church whenever he, he felt like it, just a little flippant about it almost, a little arrogant about it. I actually told somebody, he said, uh, you know, there are a lot of Sundays when I preach hard. I mean, I'm, I'm just, I preach hard. I, it's, not, it's not always easy. And he, he made a comment about that to one of the members one time that, uh, he wasn't going to have somebody up there preaching at him. I'm thinking, well, why did you even come to church? What do you think this? What do you think we're doing here? What do you think all of this is about? It's through the foolishness of preaching that people come to Christ. And so, positional righteousness is to be reflected in practical righteousness. You cannot have positional righteousness without this work of practical righteousness actually taking place. And that desire to live a holy life comes directly from the indwelling Holy Spirit. If, if a person believes that they are saved,
but they don't they do not have any real desire to live a righteous life then in reality they are not saved why would you or me or anyone else want to give them the impression that they were saved when there was nothing in their life there was no ongoing work of sanctification if the Holy Spirit has actually in reality justified them then he guarantees that they will be sanctified I mean he absolutely guarantees that that they will become conformed to the image of Christ if he calls somebody and he justifies them he's going to conform them into the very image of Christ and that person that believes that they're saved but they don't have any real desire to walk with Christ in reality that person is probably sadly deceived you cannot divorce salvation and sanctification you cannot divorce the two they are part and parcel they are integral to one another if you're saved you're going to be sanctified he's begun a good work and you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ it's a work of God in the believers life it is performed by the Holy Spirit and we're called on to cooperate only those if you can put it this way, only those who are justified will be sanctified. You can say it, all of those who are justified will be sanctified. Everything that God defines as a spiritual reality in the believer also carries with it a spiritual responsibility. In other words, God says something is true of you, because it is true of you, it carries with it a certain responsibility. I'm an architect by trade. I'm a licensed architect and practiced architecture for many years. Had my own architectural firm. If, because I am an architect, because I have a stamp that I put on drawings, I, just because I am an architect, I have a responsibility because of that. You may not be an architect, so you don't have any responsibility in that area. You may be an engineer. You may be a mechanical engineer, and you, you, because you're a mechanical engineer, you have certain responsibilities. But I'm not a mechanical engineer, so I don't have any responsibility in that area. I'm an architect. But I'm also a Christian. And because I am a Christian, I have certain responsibilities. Along with my privilege, there is responsibility. For instance, it's a sp spiritual reality that believers are taught by the Holy Spirit but it's also your spiritual responsibility to study. Uh, God, the, God, the Spirit, uh, God the Holy Spirit is going to teach you, but you have got to study. If you never open your Bible, never read, never study, never do any research, you're not going to learn anything. You can't learn anything that way. It's the Holy Spirit who provides direction in your life, but you're tall, told to walk according to the Spirit. So He gives you the direction that you're supposed to walk, but then He tells you, I want you to walk. The way I've expressed this very often is that God is not going to live the Christian life for you. He's not going to live the Christian life for you. He's going to help you. He's going to strengthen you. He's going to correct you. He's going to encourage you. He's going to reprove you. He may rebuke you. He may discipline you. But you are responsible to live the Christian life. And this simple truth is part of the often misunderstood Tension is almost a paradoxical tension that exists between the sovereignty of God and a believer's personal will. Now I want to look at the word walk. And uh, when we previously studied in our last, in the last uh, semester on walking in the Spirit, we looked at the word walk. It was the Greek word peripateo, and it's the same word here. Uh, this word walk it comes from the word peri uh, which means about and pateo which means to walk so literally it means to walk about and figuratively however it signifies all of the activities of an individual's life it, it, and when it talks about walking according to the spirit it's talking about all of those areas of my life where God wants me to walk according to his spirit it is a word that is concerned with conduct 
concerned with how a person lives out their life. It refers to lifestyle. It refers to a person's manner of life, to their uh, habitual way or bent of life. And an and individual's lifestyle always reflects what they genuinely believe. The way that a person lives is a reflection of what they believe in their heart. And in most cases, what they believe about Christ. And so if a believer is willing to live in sin, that they know dishonors Christ, it's always by choice. It's never by coercion. The Holy Spirit's not coercing us to go out and live in sin. It's a choice that we make on our own. And the way that the Holy Spirit works within them is by teaching them to walk by faith in the light of sound doctrine and in continual surrender and obedience to the truth. So in verse 4, the word walk is in the present tense active voice. The present tense means that it's a continual action that needs to constantly be going on within the believer's life. It could actually be translated, anytime you come to a present tense, you could translate it as walk and keep on walking. In other words, do this today, do this tomorrow, do this next week. Just walk and keep on walking. In other words, walking in the Spirit is to be a constant spiritual activity in the believer's life. It, I, I want to say it's what we could call their way of life. It's the way that they live. This is how they live. They live by walking in the Spirit. They are depending on the Holy Spirit for strength. They're depending on the Holy Spirit for guidance. They're depending on the Holy Spirit for wisdom. They're depending on the Holy Spirit for understanding. Whatever it is that they need, they are going to the Spirit of God, to the Holy Spirit for His direction, for His input, for His guidance in their life. Whatever it is that they need in the Christian life, they're going to walk in the Spirit. They're going, to, they're going to, every day, they're going to pursue what it is that the Spirit of God wants for them. The active voice means that the subject is doing the acting versus the passive voice, which means that the action is being done to the subject. If you remember the explanation that I gave in the previous course, the active voice would be the boy hit the ball. The boy, the subject, is doing the acting. The passive voice would be the boy was hit by the ball. So where the subject is being acted upon by something else. So this thing of, it's not just letting go and letting God. It's not just this thing of walking in the Spirit. It's something that you have to do. It's an activity. It's something that you have to embrace in your life. It is... It is a part of what it means to live the Christian life, walking in the Spirit I, and on, on a daily basis. I have to constantly make decisions. I have to spend time in the Word. I have to pray over decisions that I have to make and attitudes that I have. I uh, Recently, I uh, preached a very strong message on Wednesday night. It was a very, very strong, strong message. And uh, so I sent uh, a copy of the message to Dr. Il Defonso. He is uh, about as good a friend as a, as a man could have. And I sent him the message for him to listen to just to make sure that I wasn't over the top a little bit. I'm not, I'm not into beating my congregation up at all. I, I, I love them. They're, they're, they're precious to me. And I don't want to take advantage of their goodness to me and their love for me by... Just, just pounding away on something that's a little too harsh or a little too strong at times. I want to be forceful. I want to teach to persuade. I, I'm, not, I'm not interested in just being diplomatic about everything. There's some hard things that need to be said, and that's fine, and I'm going to say those things. But I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't over the top. I didn't know if I needed an adjustment. And so I sent that to him. So... Every believer is told to walk in the, to the Spirit, and that requires a volitional choice on their part. It is a volitional possibility that is dependent on the decision of the believer's will. In other words, are they willing to choose to do what God wants them to do, or are they not willing to do that? 
If you know that God wants you to do something, if His Word has commanded it, if it's clear, are you willing to do that? Are you willing to walk according to the Spirit? And every, you know, God is going to compel each one of us through His Word, but we have to make a choice and make a decision that we will walk in the Spirit. Now God has created a new life within the believer. This is remarkable to me. But it is a life that requires a very definite response, a very defined response from me personally. He's given the believer the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And so this new life which God has created within them, and of which they have become invariably conscious, is manifested, made known, revealed to others, by their walking in the Spirit. The only way that you can know whether or not this life exists in me is by looking at my life and seeing how it is that I live. If you found out tonight that I was running around on my wife, that when I left this class that I went out and got drunk, that I went to a bar and cursed and gambled and uh, did did unrighteous things, you wouldn't take this course anymore. Why? Because my life, your life, our life is what manifests the fact that we are of God, that we are Christians, that we believe in Christ, that we are walking according to the Spirit. And so invariably the question of what represents biblical salvation is always being asked. Somebody's going to say, well, do you believe that so-and-so is saved? And for the most part, the answer should always be the same. Is there biblical fruit in their life? Is there something in their life, something constant, something that's in the active, something that's uh, in the present tense, something that's going on in an active way, something that they are doing? Are they walking in the Spirit and according to the Spirit? And is there something that validates and verifies and authenticates the reality of what they say that they actually have. Other than just some mere words and a mere kind of declaration that somebody may make that has absolutely has had absolutely no effect in their life whatsoever. I know so many people like that. They made all the right declarations. But there's absolutely no evidence in their life of the fact that they have salvation. If there's no lasting biblical fruit, then the reality of their salvation needs to be questioned. Biblical fruit is the evidence of the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in a believer. Biblical fruit is the evidence Somebody's going to say, well, I mean, obviously some people are more mature than others. Well, so they are, but their biblical fruit is still the genuine evidence in that individual's life. Every child of God who is born of the Spirit will grow in the Spirit and will walk in the Spirit. Every single one of them. Sanctification is a process guaranteed by the Holy Spirit the moment that He indwells the believer. So walking in the Spirit involves a certain fundamental level of effort on the believer's part. God is not going to live the Christian life for the believer. He will give you everything you need, but He's not going to live the Christian life for you. Scripture clearly states this in the different places. In Ephesians 4, it says that we're to put on the new man. Put on the new man, put off the old man, and put on the new man. Okay, we will close there for tonight. Thank you.